Hello, I'm Lane Hartzell of the Korea Industry and Technology Times. I'm here with Deanna Meyer of Prairie Protection Colorado and also Deep Green Resistance. Hi, Deanna. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, when I uh, approached you about a discussion and an interview, I'd asked you about the forest. And um, you are there in the Colorado forest in the Rocky Mountains, a very beautiful place, a place that I uh, spent some time. And um, uh, we, we've talked about this in, in class before, in Echo Philosophy with Deep Green Resistance and um, Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, and so forth. Uh, I want to start out by reading to you the Akkadian epic of Gilgamesh, which is the foundational myth of uh, civilization, Western civilization too, and then uh, proceed up to the current times. Uh, when uh, writing in, this is around 5,000 years ago, this comes to us from, the, the tablets were compiled into Akkadian myth and we have uh, parts of the tablets. So I'm going to read from number 39, which is, you know, I call this the poetry of the foundation of Western civilization. Uh, he, Gilgamesh, went down to trample the forest. And th this time it was a cedar forest there in the Levant, uh, Lebanon and so forth. He went down to trample the forest. After killing the forest guardian, he discovered the secret abode of the gods. Gilgamesh felling the trees, in Quito, choosing the timber, in Quito, for people that are listening, is the sidekick to King Gilgamesh in their war um, rapaciousness. Uh, going down to another verse, by your strength, Gilgamesh, you slew the guardian. What can you dishonor? What can bring you dishonor? Lay low the forest of cedar. When we look at the uh, Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, the Greek Isles, uh, no more forests. No more, I mean, there's trees, but it's not uh, anything like what it was at the time where the sun didn't even touch the ground. They were so thick. And let's go 5,000 years later up to current times, just in the last couple of decades. Harry Merlot of Louisiana Pacific, the big timber company, he said, we need everything out there. We don't log to a 10-inch top or an 8-inch top. So they're talking about cutting the, you know, the stump. Uh, or a six inch top, we log to infinity because we need it all. It's ours, it's out there, and we need it all now. Uh, now, I want to talk about the ideology of, um, of this kind of culture and what the forest have had to bear. So that's my lead in for you to just discuss your understanding of, of the forest and of this civilization. Yeah, I mean, like they say, forests precede us and deserts dog our heels in terms of civilizations. And um, it's pretty much the same story that's gone on and on every time different civilizations take over um, and other land masses. They take everything they can and start viewing the forest not as a community to enter into relationship with, but as a bunch of resources to extract and profit off of. Um, and so our stories have been lost about our connection with the land in our agricultural pursuits and in our pursuit to grow our own population and civilization just by its own nature, because it has to continue to take other land bases and, and, uh, and hoard resources, destroys the forest and destroys the land. And yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of like the history of the agricultural war on forests and there's a lot you could say. I mean, like I always think it's interesting to think about what North America was prior to colonization in terms of forests and hear the accounts of where a squirrel could actually run uh, across North America from tree to tree that the forests were that connected. And um, just seeing what's even happening. Well, I mean, and, and seeing now too that there's the forests now are in more risk than, than they've been in my lifetime um, because of different projects that are going through in clearing what's left, taking what's left. So it hasn't really slowed. I mean, we've taken from other places where we can't see in North America here <clears throat> up until now, like, and the forest service is always, its goal is to, um, so that's who I'm working and trying to fight now are these forest service projects who um, still, who in the forest service was created to 
continue forests. So they wanted to make a sustainable yield. And they knew just like with a lot of hunting regulations and everything else that have happened, that if they continue to allow the forest to be destroyed at the rate that they were being destroyed, and this happened in 1905 when the Forest Service started as a bureaucracy, that there would be no forest left. And the concern wasn't like, oh, no, there'll be no forest, even though, you know, people enjoy forests and people enjoyed hunting in the forest. But the idea was, how are we going to build more buildings in our homes and continue to profit off the forest if they're gone? Um, so the Forest Service kind of did a sustained yield thing where they the, and they're under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's the that's who runs this bureaucracy. And their idea was to turn all the forests into big, uh, sustainable uh uh, uh, crops. Uh, and to do that, you know, you thin them all out and that only lasts for a few rotations before the forest actually doesn't regrow. So we're kind of at that end point now of where they're taking the last of what they were able to preserve under the forest service dominion. Like we have different things in North America for like national park service. That's going to be a lot more protected and it is protected wilderness areas. You're not supposed to have anything to, going in there, destroying them or, or interrupting what's happening in those. So there are certain designations that are much more protected, but the forest service has a huge, huge, you know, control over, you know, millions of acres and they are able, and their goal has always been to extract trees and to log that's the, that's who they serve they serve the logging industry and their goal is to make sure the logging industry can continue to log the the yeah so so the in the case of um the actual practice of this the logging is public registry right as and, and of course the epic of gilgamesh you can pick up in the library um and uh, harry marlowe's quote was in you know major you know, newspapers and so forth, and, and only confronted by environmentalists. With all of this public record, not not hard to find. I mean, these these are right out there. People aren't responding at the level that they should uh, to to prevent or to at least uh, democratize how this happens. I mean, would you can you comment on the the actual psychology that you think of the culture, or do you want to go in the direction of you know how this process carries out? I mean, we could do both, but I mean, the psychology of the culture is how the process carries out, <laughs> probably, because I mean, just like if everywhere you go with forest service land, it'll say like up here, I live in the Pike National Forest. So the signs will say land of many uses. So all the national forests right. in North America I've have that. that. Yes, they always say whatever forest it is. And underneath it is land of many uses on all of the forests throughout the United States that are controlled by the Forest Service. So the mentality is of course, like I said in the beginning, that <clears throat> forests are something that are there for our entertainment, for our use, for our pleasure, and for extracting. It's not there in itself as a as an entity that should be valued or as something people should go and enter into relationship with and try to listen to and try to learn from. Where when in from what we know of indigenous cultures, we know a couple of things they didn't they were able to live in place for a very long time. So that we do know for sure, like tens of thousands of years or longer, and they didn't destroy the ability of the land to sustain them, to allow them to live. They took care of the land in a way that was reciprocal and did not destroy the water and did not destroy the air and did not destroy the forest. And, and that works. But when you kill it all and you continue to diminish what's there, then you end up being diminished yourself and in multiple ways spiritually right now i think a lot of diminishment happens with our cultural view of the forest and the idea that that people even up here we have one of the most popular dirt bike trails that runs through the forest that people come from all over north america to run on these miles and miles of trails on their motorcycles and they're they they come up here and make sure they don't have mufflers the louder, the better, the harder they can rev them. And they see the forest just as a playground and nothing of value other than their pure enjoyment. These adult men going out there who have never grown up and are their, their idea of the forest is to rip through it and not even pay attention to it and get as many thrills from the terrain as possible. 
And so, I mean, that, and, and the forest service itself and that idea is like, we have to be able to make money, um, whether it's through right now, they're huge scam of trying to convince everybody that if they cut all the forest, there won't, they won't burn. So because it's where the <laughs> fires are burning more and more, what we can do is stop jo- I, can't, I can't help but laugh at this. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead. I just couldn't help yeah. but, um, yeah. It is funny when you think about it. I mean, like I, when I first started getting into this issue because they were cutting my backyard, in fact, my mom went into a contract where I live with the Forest Service to thin it. And I thought at the time that the Forest Service was uh, serving the forest, that it was a, that they knew what they were talking about. They were scientists and that this thinning deal was a good deal. It would improve, they say it will improve the health of the forest, right? And it'll help the forest. It'll protect the forest from burning. And so they come in and they thin is the word. It's really logging, but they get all this money now so that it's even they're not really in these areas where I'm around, they don't, they don't take logs out. They take a very small number of logs out or they stack all the logs in these huge piles and let them sit. Um, But they, they, or, but mostly they're mulching up the trees with these big heavy equipments that just take the trees and chop them. It's very awful. The sound, the idea of it, these are living beings, they're killing them. They're putting them through a mulcher that chops them into thousands of little pieces and spitting them back down on the ground. And this does benefit the logging industry because it's the log logging people who are who have all this equipment and are being paid to get all this equipment with government grants that are paid for by the public this is all public funded and they're able to make um, millions of dollars these companies to just destroy the forest to not even take the logs out and build with them um so it's an interesting it's an interesting idea it's a approach and the the um justification of the atrocity is really interesting too because they'll all say that just what i said it improves forest health and it's going to keep people safe but the truth of the matter is the most destructive fire that ever happened in colorado in terms of buildings being destroyed and homes being affected was the marshall fire and that's not a forest at all it's a grassland and it's also and the wind was so strong during that day what what drives fires, there's two things that drive fires, and that's wind and climate. And you have to have those combinations to have a hot fire that can do a lot of damage to people's homes and structures and, you know, who, that can burn through the forest. You know, there's a big controversy on whether or not that's damage because forests are adapted to fires and they need fires to be able to be healthy, including a lot of species that live in those forests. But um, the, the only way you could ever stop a fire once the wind you can't stop the fire when the climate is and is and when the climate is really dry and the wind is really fast it's not going to happen what's going to stop that fire is the weather when the wind stops and some rain comes in then somebody might be able to say that they helped put it out because that's when they could get control of it quote unquote but really it's ultimately the weather that controls these fires and even if you, when I first started thinking about this, Tim Hermack, who works uh, with forests and protecting forests with the Native Forest Council, he said to me, he's like, the only way anyone could ever prevent a fire is if they cut all the trees, got rid of all the vegetation and installed a huge amount of sprinkler systems that constantly ran. So <laughs> meaning like, it's not, that's impossible. That's ridiculous. Nobody would think about doing that. And it wouldn't work anyway. I mean, when does the water run out? You're just going to water millions and millions and millions of acres of forest while you kill them all. And get, it's just, the whole thing's ludicrous. And when we look at the big fires in North, like the Paradise Fire and all these four fires that were very devastating to homes and to communities that happened in California and in the West in the past, you know, five years, they were all heavily thinned. The Forest Service had already done their damage and they've shown in a lot of in a research, a really great research paper that went through 1500 different fires that did a good amount of what damage to human structures and that were hot fires. They went and studied the landscape afterwards and they found in the in that research of actually on the ground looking at what happens with fires that thinning made fires more intense than less intense in almost all cases. So where the forests weren't touched and where they were thick, because what the forest service, a forest service lie is like forest fires are um, predicated on uh, ladder, on ladder fuels or on fuel load, they say fuel load. So they're trying to tell us and tell people, which anybody who pays attention 
pension would know this, that fire intensity equates with how much, how much wood is in the forest. And that's just totally not true. Um, fire severity is equated with heavy winds and dry conditions. And the heavier, the, like a forest retains moisture in it. So if you've got a forest that the forest service would say, oh, this is messy because it hasn't been logged. It hasn't been thin. It hasn't been cleared to look like some kind of a park um, with a few trees, in, you know, distantly spaced. Then uh, th those, th when they are, they retain the moisture in the ground. They don't burn as hard. And the windbreak, they have windbreak. So if you open up the canopy, we call the forest, and you make it a very open place, the wind can run through it there much faster than it could in a densely dense forest. Also, in a thin forest, in an open canopied forest, everything's much drier because the sunlight hits the ground and it dries up the soil. In a thick forest, and like we call them the north, they are the north-facing slopes here that don't get uh, the south sun. They're really, they can tend to be really thick and moist, but that slows fires. It does not increase the speed in them. It's all dependent on the wind. So anybody who's going to use common sense and actually go out and look at areas that have been burned or pay attention to when these catastrophic, catastrophic, they call it, but when these, let's say high intensity, severe fires come through, like in paradise, that was all wind. And that wind took them up Maui. I mean, what just that, that is wind. That is like, so and, let, and me, climate. Uh, let me jump in because electric too, by the way. Electric, electricity too is like, you know, all of the electric poles start a lot of fires, but yeah, go ahead. As you were talking, I was thinking of these towns, these small cities that are obliterated, gone uh, due to this kind of thing. You, you mentioned it. What, so what is happening there? It's the wind is blowing this, this heat, this. Uh, yeah. I mean, what, what what's catching on fire? Is it the trees in the city or is it just the heat coming in and just, it, I don't know, burns up the houses? Yeah, when you look at paradise, a lot of the trees are still standing and the houses went up like bombs. I mean, you think about all of our homes are highly flammable. We have propane tanks all around our homes, right? We have uh, shingles. Lots of people use shingles. They don't have the metal roof. A lot of the, the best way to try to to uh, mitigate fire so that you're going to have the least damage to your residence is to fireproof your home, not the forest. So, you know, you, you would make sure that you're, you don't have gutters that have a bunch of uh, debris in them. That's a big cause of fire. You would make sure that you're, you have a metal roof. You would want to clear around your house from 50 to hundred feet. No more than that. They've shown very clearly that, you know, a hundred feet around your house is what is, what makes an impact, you know? Um, and you'd want to be able to to make sure like the vents on the side of your eaves, uh, and I have some too, but that, that is a risk because sparks can get into those vents and then they can catch your roof on fire, which insulation is very flammable. So our homes, mm. our structures are very flammable. So when you get a forest fire that's coming through, that's really hot and fast and moving through these areas and that have homes it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're going to get bombs. And I've seen lots of those pictures, even of paradise. And it is true. It's like what burned the most was the structures, the forests and the trees were still standing in a lot of the places. Um, so, yeah. And, and it really is the, the, like in the Marshall fire, that was, that was a hundred percent drought. I mean, it was dry. This was in, I believe it happened in December. It was in the winter and there was a drought and the wind was crazy. It was like a hundred and some mile an hour winds there in Boulder. Boulder gets crazy wind, as you know, as it is. And that day was this really wild wind. And I think I forget, I think it was either a combination of electric poles or a fire that somebody had started a day before that hadn't been put all the way out. So when the wind hit it, you know, if you, you've got a bunch of sparks going, the wind is going to kick up that fire. Um, I think it was a combination of a couple of those things. I, I think they finally figured it out. They were always trying to figure it out. And I didn't, I, I don't remember exactly what the cause was, but um, yeah, I mean, that's a fire doesn't just move very far and fast and rapidly without wind, you know, can and you without a drought. Us, can you just tell us quickly where these locations are, uh, Marshall fire and so forth? Okay. Marshall fires in Boulder. Paradise is in California. Okay, so Boulder, think, Colorado. Boulder, Cal California. Yeah, Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and that was the most devastating fire in Colorado, in the history of Colorado, in terms of homes lost and, and human structures burned. 
So that was the most expensive. Uh, and it was, you know, and people were evacuated everywhere. It was devastating for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of families because it just leveled their homes. But, you know, and that's, that's just my point too. Like that is not, that wasn't even in a forest. That's not a forest. That was the grassland. The, the, the Australian officials had reported that uh, in one of those major fires, I guess it was about two years ago, something like a billion animals were killed. And I don't know how many displaced and probably trillions of insects. Uh, most people may not think about this, but why should we think about this? Yeah, I'm not really familiar with all the animals that get killed in those fires. I mean, but you mean, why should we be focusing on on the loss of the biotic world? Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, we could go on about that. I for know a long it's time. obvious, but I'm, but yeah. I'm asking yeah, yeah, no, it. No, I mean, number it's working. Yeah, yeah. And, and these fires are like you're talking about this. A lot of this is climate related. It's from us destroying habitat and the the, the climate drying, heating, all of this stuff, temperatures going up, carbon going up, all of these various things, which is all like the root of it all is habitat destruction. Like a lot of people now are talking and talking about how, how it's bogus to just focus on carbon. And I can agree with that too. I mean, but, a, but a huge increase in carbon is a danger <laughs> as well. And it's happening. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the more we lose in diversity and the more we lose of species and habitat, the 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 less likely especially now because it seems you know my it seems like well it doesn't seem we are destroying habitat at a very rapid rate we are over we're an overshoot like for our population and we need these I, healers like biodiversity is the only chance we have for helping resolve our problems restoration, bringing back beavers, for example, here in North America. I mean, these beavers are fire, are, are fire mitigators. You've got big beaver ponds. You don't have the fire's not going to burn through them. They had, they played such a central role in keeping a check on fire, you know, and, and water retention anywhere is a very important thing. So, I mean, any, any loss of a keystone species and over a huge amount of, of land, especially in those massive, massive fires that are, are going crazy is uh is cause for all of us to be concerned uh mm -hmm. you know loss of anything's cause yeah and then on the other hand you know fires as well are essential they're not the demons that we've also made them out to be either um because they're essential for healthy healthy you know forests because they regenerate everything but when they're super hot and fast it's pretty hard for the forest to come back from that too so i mean there's different levels of it and i'm not a Fire expert and I don't exactly know like the the but I do know that severe fires hot intense fires are necessary in lots of places too to help regenerate what's there um when it happens in a huge mass scale it sure is concerning and it's scary and it adds a lot more carbon and it just you know there's a lot of things it's it's occurring more where it hadn't before so it's a big loss to even you know contemplate all that but, you know, the solution is not for this cult. This culture is not good at solutions at all. I mean, you know, the, all of our solutions are insane, meaning that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Like you don't sit there and go, oh, let's stop fires by cutting down the forest. We know that's ridiculous. Why don't we stop fires by starting to live more locally? Why don't we try to stop fires by stopping uh, fossil fuel use and, and, you know, windmills and solar, which is all about an extraordinary, uh, use of energy, which isn't sustainable. It's not sustainable to, to be able to do what we're doing right now and to live like the emperors we think we are right now, you know? So those are more, and then for people who live in the forests, firewise your homes, that's what they call it. Fire wising your homes, you know, be careful. And, and also realize if you move in the forest, your home might burn. Even if you fire wise it, that's your risk that you're going in there. People who move into earthquakes, same thing. People who move into flood zones. I mean, I'm sorry about that. There's always something happening that in, in whatever region you live in that will become more catastrophic as the climate starts to unravel. I, I, I kind of chuckle when you said there's always something happening. <laughs> looking at the world today yeah 
the, yeah. the, it was interesting you you mentioned we're emperors i mean the luxuries of the past are commonplace today right so if everybody wants to live at the say the level of a, a middle class person in the united states or or uh, japan or germany it just is not going to happen uh, but I, while I, while i've got you here i want to ask you about ancient forests do you know anything about how I, I was talking with people on facebook the other day about this and we were trying to understand this when you cut a forest you only can cut it like what three times is this right that's what i've heard that's what okay. the research for for the ancient forest do you know how long it would take to to get from say something that's denuded up to an ancient forest i mean this must take centuries right uh, do you have any information on that I don't. And I agree with you. That would take centuries. I mean, that's, I guess when you look at a lot of these forests that still have a lot of old growth trees and then looking at the age that trees can live till, which can be extraordinary depending on the species, a thousand, four thousand years some trees have lived. Um, and, you know, if you have all that, that's a thing too. Like when you get the fires and when you have like natural uh, disaster or not disasters, I hate using that word, but natural occurrences happening, the all the materials are still in the forest to help regenerate it so when you're burning you're having all the ashes and everything when you're logging it and extracting it and destroying habitat and doing crops and destroying the soil you're causing real problems where it makes it harder and harder for anything to come back so you know you're you're extract these extract these industries of extraction i would i would imagine i mean like if you had a regular forest and a fire went through that was a very hot severe forest and it wasn't already completely damaged from the actions and the behaviors of civilizations going through and di diminishing the capacity of, of return, the diminishing the capacity of healing, diminishing all the mycelium and all the healers that live in that forest, then I, I would imagine it's probably a much more rapid turnaround in for forests that are, say, in wilderness where fire comes through. And, and my, I would, I would guess that that would definitely be the case. They would, then you get all the plants and the beautiful stuff and the com things coming back, which people have shown after fires in a short time, this amazing generate regeneration of growth and all these new baby trees coming up. Cause lots of trees need the fire to even pop their seeds out like the pines. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, but, but as you go and destroy the soil, I don't know. I mean, how long will it take for the fertile crescent to come back to being a fertile crescent and have its soil? I mean, would it, it will it ever? Um, probably if people would leave it alone, uh, it's going to take longer, though, than, say, a forest that didn't have an extractive community, you know, a, their soil completely denuded and the the trees completely extracted and taken elsewhere. So, I mean, that's. Yeah, that's a, yeah. that's certainly a concern, right? The the ancient forest. You mentioned the what is it, the ponderosa pines. If you w go up to one and and smell it, it smells like butterscotch. Is that yeah. that's right? It's the ponderosa, yeah, yeah, yeah. butterscotch. Yeah. It's really especially when in the winters. It's it's cool because in the summers is when it starts to smell. So in the winter, you know, the sap goes back into their roots and protects them from the cold, and then in the summer and the spring the sap starts moving back up the tree to the, to the needles. And that's when you really smell, that's when it really starts to smell like butterscotch and pine. And the older that they are, the stronger their smell is. It's pretty cool. It smells it's very It's quite good. magical. The, the forest is. is quite magical. It's, it's, it is. It's incredible. Uh, it is. Deanna, thank you so much for talking with me today. Thank you. I'm Lane Hartzell with Korea Industry and Technology Times.